Hey folks, Al Puglisi, Al Puglisi Trains. Today we have a spectacular treat, uh, Dave Moultra, correct? Yes. And the name of your, your layout? It's basically Moultra Steel, uh -huh. uh, but it encompasses an area from Youngstown to Ambridge, which a lot of people know as Conway Yards area. Uh -huh. And uh, it represents two railroads that went through my hometown. And my hometown was Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania, which is about 22 miles north and west of Pittsburgh. Okay. And it's the last exit on the Pennsylvania Turnpike before you go into Ohio. Wow. So we're about 20 miles from Youngstown. So Youngstown Steel was involved in a lot of that. And about the same amount uh, from Conway, well, actually Conway Yards was only six miles away from Beaver Falls, so uh, Ambridge was probably the town closest to that, if you want to talk about it. And so, this is this is an HO scale? HO scale layout that I've been working on since 2001, although I had a steel mill layout in my other house. Mm -hmm. And starting at this area right inside the basement door is the main yard at Youngstown Sheet and Tube, okay. which became Youngstown Steel. And we don't show a lot of the mill. We have a couple of mill buildings down there that can represent almost anything. Okay. There is a. Let me let me snake by you, Dave. Yeah, let me get. There is a. Uh, Holy smokes. There is a blast furnace backdrop up against the wall. Uh huh. Just to represent the backdrop, and I've added extra lights to it because that's something that makes. Uh, Blast furnaces look really good. Uh -huh. We have tracks that you can see like a track going through the corner of the one building. That's fairly common. And this wow. big set of buildings here, uh, the, the main part of the building makes no sense whatsoever. I bought it from a guy who makes buildings using a whole bunch of parts, but it's representing my tin mill. Uh -huh. And the tin mill is where you do tin coating and also galvanizing. This is spectacular. It's it, so, so you built this? You kit Yes. Back? And around over here. All right. Let me just swing around real quick. Um, and let me get in and this is spectacular. Holy smokes. Let me, I'm going to keep my mouth shut. So over here I had a corner where I didn't have room for a full building so the idea was I could make a cutaway building that would show the inside and give people an idea of what's going on and this is a, what they call a cold rolling mill so they don't have the uh, steel heated up uh -huh. and we start off and the only problem we have with model railroading is we have to compress everything because in real life this could be you know like a quarter of a mile long. Right. So the first roller is like the uh, basic roller. The, it's the initial roller that kind of gets it going. And then we have a five stand set of rollers that do the final finish, which is the final tolerance of the coil. And we're making flat steel that's going to be rolled into a coil. Uh -huh. And when it comes out the other end, I've scratch built a coiler that takes that steel and coils it all up and it pushes it down onto this uh, ramp where we hold the coils until they're taken away to be stockpiled. This is spectacular. And the crane, uh, that Morgan crane up there, 60 ton Morgan crane, and the sign is actually off of one of their advertisements. Oh my goodness. My wife made that for me. And I found out that the most common way that cranes lift coils is a, is a device that comes in from both ends of the opening. So I tried to duplicate that. And he could either load it directly into cars, which is part of our operational thing, uh -huh. or we could store it in a warehouse. Let me pause this real quick, two sure. seconds. Folks, now, I... The, the, go ahead, I'm the sorry. The building you see in front of the blast furnace are the cooling towers, as they call them. Uh -huh. uh, they use a lot of water in the blast furnaces to try to keep the whole thing from melting down. Okay. Uh, and that water has to be cooled after it gets really hot. So they have those cooling towers, as they call them where the water runs through and gets cooled off and then it's reused again, of course. Wow, I'm gonna try and do an aerial view of this back side of this structure. This is incredible. How long did it take for you to scratch build this? Or to, to... It, it's, a, it's a work in progress. And uh, I'm, I'll show you a building around the corner that's taking me months and I'm still working and I have to stop every once in a while and start over again because it's just, it's tedious. It's tedious. Let me just get back here. This is absolute, folks, this is beyond breathtaking. Let me pause this here.
And, uh, Dave, you were talking about uh, yeah, specialty cars. Let's I, see. I really like specialty cars. That's one of my favorite things is to create them. This is an Alice Chalmers uh, car, and there's pictures of it in one of the Morning Sun books uh -huh. on open loads. And he's carrying a heat exchanger, which I kind of wasn't sure what it should look like, so I kind of made it up. Mm -hmm. And the heat exchanger can come out of the car. And so you see it's a well car. And so the heat exchanger is carried. You have to have a well car because it's so tall. Uh -huh. And the second car is another heat exchanger, a totally different type. Now that was a a resin kit that I put together, and it's sitting on a uh, a flat car from uh, Intermountain. Uh -huh. And it has all the tie downs, which are correct for uh, what is required for that kind of transport. This is spectacular. Let me just pause this here. All right, let's walk through into the other room. Now we're starting. Okay, Go ahead. so we're yep. starting to get into Moultrip steel. And Moultrip steel begins with. We are an integrated mill, so we start with iron ore out of the ground. Uh huh. And um, so we use blast furnaces to smelt the iron. Okay. To get the iron into a liquid form. Uh, and then from there, it is transported to steel making furnaces using a variety of hot metal transport cars. We have, these are called submarine cars, and these can handle 200 tons of, of molten iron. And they will, and of course, part of my operational things is, is operators have to take these, pick them up at the blast furnace, and take them over to the steel making. Uh, furnaces. Uh, and then we have a different type of car, which is the open top hot metal cars, which are used for short runs, where you're not as worried about losing heat loss too much. Uh -huh. And they go to my other type of, of steel making furnaces. And in the background, these are the slag cars. And slag is the waste product from smelting iron, uh -huh. and it's uh, it will float, because it's lighter than the iron, it will float on top, and we will put it into those slag cars, and the slag cars go to a dump, and it's reprocessed into building materials. This is spectacular. So, <laughs> and then we have a second, this is the older blast furnace, and the top works of this is completely scratch built. Uh, it was essentially a Walters blast furnace, but one of my pet peeves is when you see people steal mills in the magazines, mm -hmm. you see the Walters Blast Furnace built stock. Okay. And I want mine to not look like the Walters Blast Furnace. I want it to look totally different. So all of the top of the Blast Furnace is scratch built. I use the floor, I use the furnace shell, and the rest of it is scratch built. It's magnificent. I use the dust catcher. Now this is the gas cleaning equipment, which is the very complicated looking stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, has a lot of valves and pipes and everything because the gas coming off the combustion process of smelting the iron mm -hmm. is a fuel. It's usable. Okay. So the idea is that you want to save that. So you bring it through a cleaning set that involves three steps. The dust catcher, mm -hmm. gas washer, which uses water, mm -hmm. and the electrostatic precipitator, which is a bug zapper, essentially. Uh -huh. And when you come out of that, you have 95% clean fuel. Oh, my goodness. That fuel is used to power the powerhouse okay. and also the engines that are inside the gray building there that are ones that develop the giant blast of air that makes it a blast furnace. This structure, okay, so this is the powerhouse here? This is the powerhouse is here. Okay. Uh, and he generates power for the steel mill and other uses. And this is what they call the blowing engine house. Okay. And it has these giant turbo blowers in there that generate not a real high, people think of blast furnaces as real high pressure. It's only about 30 PSI, mm -hmm. but it's a huge volume of air. Okay. So, and there'll usually be numerous ones of these blowing engines in there, and they're usually powered by blast furnace gas. Now, this building, this green building, what is... The green building is a limestone processing, and what they do... Now, limestone is used in a rock form uh -huh. in the blast furnace, because that's what helps separate the impurities from the iron. Okay. But in this case, we're taking lime and liquefying it, because when we haul away the slag, those are in iron pots. And okay. And if you don't put a... a 
release agent in there, which is liquid lime, the, the slag will stick and it gets in there and it's really hard to get out. Mm -hmm. So this generates liquid lime and then over here we can run the slag cars past this area here and a, a worker stands up here with a hose, with a nozzle, uh -huh. and as they run these slag cars through, he sprays them with limestone. Good Lord. All right, let me pause this just a second here. Sure. All right, Dave, now what, this is the second last this is, furnace? Uh, this is B furnace. Okay. And uh, it's a larger furnace with a larger capacity. It's the newer one. So everything is larger. It has a larger dust catcher. Uh -huh. And it's been reinforced around. with bands. Okay. These valves are very interesting for everybody. They're known as goggle valves. And they're used when you're opening and closing uh, this high pressure, high volume uh, uh material that's coming through here uh -huh. so it's not like you can't do a regular valve so it has to be one that operates that way and there are numerous goggle valves throughout this this structure is breathtaking too and this was kit bashed and scratch built or uh, it's it's uh the top the whole top is scratch built this is pretty much the walters kit up here because i intend to modify it i haven't got to it yet okay the stoves are 3d printed oh good uh from uh an outfit called steel mill modeler supply mm -hmm. and uh you can see this is a flare not the most realistic thing but that's where we burn off if we have too much of this flammable gas coming through the uh, gas cleaning equipment we burn it off as a flare this is this is magnificent and that's something you would normally see when you would drive by at night you would see this uh so what a work of art now show us these next next group of buildings over in the corner here so this area here is my electric furnace well in the early 60s which my layout is about mid 60s mm -hmm. the electric furnace which is now the number one way that they make steel and by the way they're building a brand new steel mill in falling waters west virginia uh-huh uh, and it's going to use the electric furnace where you melt basically scrap and remake it into new steel. Oh, let me but, get in here. This but, is incredible. But back in the day, the electric furnace was normally figured as doing specialty steel, mm -hmm. high quality tool steel or whatever. And in my case, we're doing stainless steel, which is one of our products. And the other thing is we are making large steel ingots uh -huh. for a forge company. And here's an idea of some of the large ingots that we're making. Okay, let's see. I could bring that car further out. No, this is good. And I've had people tell me that that one ingot is just so big they can't believe it's true. But it's in it's in a book, and that's that's the size they were. The, and this, they're huge. This is just, folks, in person, this is beyond spectacular. I mean, it is just... Now, it's a little hard to see, but back in between... You have to watch the wires. Right. Back in between the buildings, if mm -hmm. you can kind of look at that angle, is a scratch-built ladle transfer car. So we make... When we're making large ingots, it's going to take multiple pores of the electric furnace to get enough steel to fill the mold with that large ingot. Let me pause it here and I'm going to come around the other side okay. just real quick. Okay. All right, Dave, we're on the other side of this. Go ahead. Go ahead. Right, and now you can see our electric furnace shop, which is normally called an EAF, okay. electric arc furnace. Uh, my wife made the signs up for me. That's in this large building, which is a two Walters buildings put together. Okay. Now, one of the things that was interesting was my cousin worked at a steel mill in Beaver Falls, the last one that's there. Uh -huh. And nobody knew what was inside this vent on the top of the steel mill. People had different ideas of what it was. So I visited my cousin's steel mill one day, and I asked him, I said, can we go up on the roof? Uh-huh. And he said, sure. Oh, my so Lord. So we went up on the roof of the electric arc furnace, what they call a melt shop. Uh -huh. And I got to look inside that vent and take a lot of pictures, and therefore I was able to duplicate exactly what it looks like. Wow. I don't know if anybody else has done that. Well, that's bravery. That, let so, me pause this real quick. Dave, tell us about this area here. This now, this, this is a reciprocating act. Does that actually work to dump? It, it uh, does not. It, it is it is for looks only. Okay. But for operational purposes, this is my ore yard, and we bring in empty uh, loaded ore trains. Okay. And you see here an empty one that's ready to be picked up. I have right. a loaded one in the uh, in the queue ready to come out. Uh huh. And he will come in and swap loads for empties, and. 
we can actually have a switcher start pushing the cars through the rotary dump. Uh -huh. The rotary dump will turn the cars upside down. He can usually do two at a time. Like okay. these cars, he can do two at a time. They dump down into a pit down below. Mm -hmm. They get picked up by the conveyor. Okay. And this conveyor is modeled after a picture that I could show you. It goes up, it goes across, and then it dumps into the ore yard here. This is magnificent. The, so, let's these overhead cranes. The, the, tell me about these two cranes in front of us. These are known as Hewlett unloaders. They were designed in 1912 by a guy named Hewlett. Surprisingly, they were very common for unloading the lake boats. Okay. Uh, they had some at Whiskey Island, which was Cleveland. They had them along the shores of all the big steel mills on the Great Lakes. Uh, they were electrically powered. They were dinosaurs, but they were very efficient. And one thing that made them efficient was their ability to go down into the hold of the ship. Uh -huh. And one thing that's very interesting is the operator rode in the leg along with the with the bucket. Okay, now how did you build these? It was totally from scratch? Or? No, this actually is one of the few kits that Walters came up with that is full scale and it's absolutely accurate. Really? Now the problem is, not a problem, but it is a difficult kit to build. Oh, I can imagine. So, uh, I but come around this end here. I have no business having these on my railroad. But I liked them, so I wanted to find a place I could use them on the railroad. So my idea was that we would bring in our limestone by barges, right. and we needed two of these to unload the barges. And uh, so that's the idea. Is, it's spectacular. Uh, is we unload this limestone, and it gets dumped back there, or we can actually load up uh, some of these... Uh, hopper cars that are here. This overhead uh, crane too, is that a scratch build or is that a kit? That is a kit that I've added a lot of detail to, extra ladders, lights, and all that other stuff. The lights aren't really working, and a bigger clamshell bucket. And this is the bridge crane, and his job is to supply the iron ore and the limestone to the blast furnaces. Okay, let me pause this here. Start. All right, let me just pan in. Dave, you were saying something about this is a, called a high line. Is that what this is? Let me see if I can fix my chain here. Kind of fell off. But... Is that some type of high line loader or dumper? Or... The reason that you have a high line is underneath there uh -huh. is another railroad car that rides through, and it's called a scale car. Okay. So you have to measure what's going to go up the skip hoist with these skip buckets right here uh -huh. and that's what takes the material up and dumps it in the top of the blast furnace wow. so down underneath there is some poor guy in the dark uh -huh. who is going around and there are <laughs> there are bins under here right that contain iron ore limestone and coke you talk about dirty jobs that yes that was a job. dirty job i rode on one of those once at acme steel wow. which is gone now and we got to ride on it. But what he would do is the blast furnace manager would call the guy in the scale car and say, for the next skip, I need a total load of so many pounds of uh, iron ore. Uh -huh. Or he may mix it. I mean, so much iron ore, so much limestone, and some coke. And so this guy had a big scale. It uh -huh. became digital after a while. And he would go and open these bins and fill up a... Uh, a uh, hopper that he had on the car uh -huh. and then he would go to where the skip hoist goes down into that underneath the high line uh -huh. and he would fill that skip hoist with whatever the blast furnace manager asked him to put in there okay and then it would go up and dump into the top of the furnace man the two is. skip buckets are counterweighted so when one goes up the other goes down and they meet each other in the middle. Wow. So me... you have one going up with the load, one coming down empty, and then the scale car will fill the next one with whatever is requested. All right, let me pause that. And it... All right, folks, I'm going to make a quick pan here across. Now, if I can jump in here. Sure, absolutely. This is my hometown, Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania, which the layout is based on. Okay. That is the real mulch of steel right there. Oh, my goodness. Along the Beaver River. Right. And really? I used to, my relatives were all in this area here. Uh -huh. This was a Republic Steel part of Beaver Falls. They had a big plant there. They didn't make steel there, but uh -huh. they did a lot of other stuff. But the largest steel company in Beaver Falls was Babcock and Wilcox, and they were off to the side. I have represented them on my railroad. 
but they're not the biggest anymore. Wow. So Moultrip has taken over. Yes, Moultrip. the biggest. So. so you're related, you're directly related to these people. Yes, and when you go <laughs> over to Jeff's, uh -huh. you will see uh, one of my relative's mansions in Beaver Falls still exists called the Moultrip Mansion mm -hmm. that just underwent a $400,000 renovation, and oh Jeff has kindly agreed to make a model of it for me. And, of course, he has one on his layout, the prototype. Wow. So... Well, let me snake across this way. So and... one other thing over here. This was a scratch-built product that I did for Plastruct. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if your viewers remember Dean Freytag, yeah. who was very well known as a uh, you know, styrene modeler, one of the early steel mill modelers who mm -hmm. scratch-built everything because nothing was available. He essentially designed all of the Walters Blast Furnace uh, steel mill products that came out. Uh -huh. But he also did stuff for Plastruck, and one of the ones he wanted to do was something called a center plant. And he sent four of us all of the materials to build the center plant because he wanted us to help with the directions. Uh, Dean tended to give directions that were confusing because he would mix up inches and centimeters and uh -huh. real feet. Uh -huh. And uh, so four of us built this thing. And what center is is... The real fine dust type particles that are iron ore, Okay. you don't want to waste those. So what they would do is they would take all that stuff to the center plant. It would get mixed with bentonite clay uh -huh. to give it a chunky appearance so it would work in the blast furnace. Obviously, dust going into the blast furnace isn't going to work. So it would bake this. Uh, these out here, this is the dryers, so it was a rotary dryer system, mm -hmm. and they will come out the other end as large enough chunks of iron ore to be used in the blast furnace. Let me go ahead and, folks, I'm going to pause this. This is going to end uh, part one. Uh, I'm going to start part two, so let me go ahead and pause it, and please be sure to watch the next video, part two.